The Rune Factory series has become a fan favorite for many over the years, and with Rune Factory 5 rising from the ashes next year in Japan, I thought I would admit my most egregious sin. I've never finished all of the Rune Factory games. In fact, I've never played any of the DS ones until now. The extent of my Rune Factory experience is 4, Frontier, and a little bit of Tides of Destiny. So I thought to myself, I am going to remedy this and play through every single Rune Factory game before Rune Factory 5 comes out and talk about the history and evolution of the series one game at a time. And today we start this off with the very first entry, Rune Factory A Fantasy Harvest Moon. If you're interested in keeping up with this redemption arc of Gamalad through the Rune Factory series, hey, be sure to subscribe as I pledge to do this for every single game in the series. So, Rune Factory A Fantasy Harvest Moon. I finally made it, huh? This is the game that started it all. What started out as a pitch to make a fantasy version of the Story of Seasons series has turned into a standalone series that is nearly on par of its parent series. This seems to happen a lot, huh? So, for a series that sparked such a dedicated fan base, even during a near seven year hiatus, one has to wonder the first game in this series must be groundbreaking and one of the best games ever. Well, we'll discuss that. This is a game that, in a vacuum, has so much deep rooted potential that is never fully explored because of the fact that it's the first game in a series, so probably not many resources were allocated to it. But the game does manage to have some sparks of genuine enjoyment that make me remember why I fell in love with this series. So, the Rune Factory series from here did bloom into a wonderful franchise. It's just that the original seedling has aged a bit like buttermilk. So yeah, first impressions are key. So without any further to do, Rune Factory A Fantasy Harvest Moon is a bad game. That's it. That's the video. Thanks for watching today's video. Commentaries like this are supported by my generous patrons on Patreon at patreon.com slash gamalad, and for those who continue to subscribe to my channel to watch new videos. So be sure to subscribe for future reviews, commentaries, let's plays, and more. And as always, everyone, thanks for watching. All right, all right, that's not really fair to this game to just cut it off there. I need to take a deep dive and explain why I feel like Rune Factory, A Fantasy Harvest Moon, has aged possibly the worst out of any video game that I have played, and why I believe it has the potential of being one of the best, too. Well, that's kind of expected, as there are six other games based off this premise, but no, I feel like the original Rune Factory, if done right, could have been a memorable time, and not just, uh, whatever this is. There are just so many things about this game that either fell flat, or just enrages me to no end, so forgive me if I'm having a hard time trying to decide where to begin with this. So, Rune Factory is broken up into a few different sections. You have your traditional farming gameplay, where it plays similar to Friends of Mineral Town in this title, your social aspect of any Story of Seasons title, and the new gameplay aspect, Dungeon Crawling. Now, the farming in this game is the only consistent thing about it, honestly, and really it's because it's a watered-down version of Friends of Mineral Towns. You get this huge area to start farming with, which is honestly really nice, and you'll be spending the majority of the first part of the game farming to get gifts for people in town, and saving up money to upgrade your tools and buy weapons. Now, the first noticeable difference with this game is that you have a stamina and an HP bar. When using tools, weapons, or anything that requires energy, you will lose stamina. And then if you run out of stamina, you'll slowly lose HP. And if you lose all of your HP, you'll of course pass out. Now, honestly, I'm pretty much okay with this system. As the further you go into the game and level up, you'll be consistently getting more HP and stamina. Coupled with tool upgrades, farming becomes pretty okay, if not a bit mundane. Honestly, regular farming never felt too rewarding outside of how critical it is if you want to stay in dungeons for extended periods of time due to how the stamina system works. Before we discuss the how, let me explain the why. Farming will be very imperative on your spelunking adventures. You see, as mentioned earlier, every swing of your weapon or spell you use will begin to drain your stamina until you're out of it and you start draining your HP to be able to attack anything. And you can see the problem here. You will constantly have to balance out your current HP levels to decide if it's wise to go in for an attack or if you risk taking more damage than you're dealing out. I've been unintentionally killed at 1 HP by using a weapon and being hit by a monster, then being struck by an enemy outright in a normal fight. It's just not fun to play against. Thankfully, future Rune Factory titles have fine-tuned this system, so you only have to deal with this interesting variant for a little bit. Now you're probably wondering, how in the world do you regain stamina? Well, I'm glad you asked, and if you didn't, well, I'm going to tell you anyway. At the start of the game, you don't. 
the game actively punishes you for using weapons in dungeons, because if you pass out while in a dungeon, it's game over and you're booted to the title screen. So I hope you didn't play the game for 3 hours and then die while trying to check on your crops in the dungeon, because if so, oops. But yeah, this is where farming in dungeons starts bearing fruits. Each dungeon has its own season, and you are free to plant stuff in those dungeons that match the season. This is key to long stays in the dungeon, as when plants grow, they have a small chance of producing wisp-like creatures known as a Rooney. These Roonies will be your main way of how you replenish your stamina while inside of a dungeon. So not only do you have to have the right supplies for your trip in the dungeon, you also have to prep the land inside of it to have a little rest area to fall back on. And I hope you didn't plan on harvesting those crops, because if you do decide to do that, you will lose your Rooney generator. Thankfully, those plants don't die, so you don't have to constantly water them, but you will have to babysit them if you want them to be of any use to you on your dungeon travels. But thankfully, to make this a bit easier, as you progress through the game, you will unlock the ability to cook, and this will supplement the need to rely on crops all the time to replenish your stamina. I guess I can now talk about the monsters in the dungeons themselves and how you go about clearing said dungeons. Scattered throughout each of them, there are generators that are constantly spawning monsters. If you want the boss door to open, you have to destroy each and every generator. That's it! No special puzzles or anything like that. Go into the dungeon, destroy the generators, and take on the boss. So you're probably thinking, oh, that's no big deal. And you're right, it's not. Until you realize you have to do it all in one go. Yup, if you have to leave the dungeon for any reason at any time at all, the generators will reset and you have to start from scratch. So say if you forgot your sleeping bag or run out of supplies halfway through, or your watering can runs out of water because the damn thing never tells you how much water you have left, so you're unable to have enough to extinguish flames that are blocking your path until it's too late, and you're about halfway through the dungeon, and you were having a pretty good run up until then. Thankfully, if you clear the area and then open the door to the boss, you'll be free to leave and come back and just have to blitz your way through to the boss door. So there is some saving grace there. But what I did find cool about exploring all of these dungeons is that you're able to recruit monsters from the dungeons to join your party. So not only can they join you in battle through different dungeons, but they're also pretty handy to keep on your farm and water your plants. Well, sometimes. But yeah, there's not much standing in your way between you and the boss outside of these generators. Speaking of the boss, you know what I really love during my intense boss fights where I'm fighting for my life? Poor hit detection. I swear, the hitboxes in this game don't exist half the time. I've been fighting monsters and bosses and I will land a direct hit on them, but because of the direction they were standing, their hitboxes were halfway to Gilinor, and they proceeded to hit my pretty big hitbox like there was no issue whatsoever. I think I died in this game more to poor hit detection than anything else. It's an amazing feeling to be so close to beating a boss, only to die because it decided to double its attack speed and causing its hitbox to be even more screwed up than it was originally. So, while it looks like I hit them, I continue to swing at air. Huh. I thought I would have more to say of how awful the hit detection is, but really, the more I played the game, I kinda got used to it? Don't get me wrong, my anger is still seething at this game, but this game committed an even more atrocious sin, something I'll go into after we discuss a bit of the social aspect of this game. Now this is the part of the game I feel like had the most potential and it just fell rather flat. On paper, the cast of the game has some really interesting characters that you would think would have a lot of involvement in the overall plot of the game. Well, the short and sweet of it is, they really don't. Sure, you can befriend everyone in town and get some more information on everyone's backstory, and sure, the game has a pretty nice selection of bachelorettes, <coughs> Rosetta Gang, but the game never goes the extra mile to make everyone come together. It makes the entire cast of the game feel like they just exist. Outside of Mist, who kidnaps us to stay on the farm and progress the plot, almost no one is really integrated into the plot in any meaningful way. Sure, the game tries to at times. Earlier in the game, someone goes missing in a dungeon and you have to rescue them, but that's about it. Nothing ever came from that. It just happened just for the sake of happening. And this really upsets me as there are a lot of characters in this game that I felt like would have benefited from more interactions with each other. But there are some examples of this, however, but they don't go too far. Such as the poet Lucas who is constantly trying to woo over Rosetta, they even share some dialogue with each other during the same room. But that's about it. It's never referenced much outside of Rosetta's disdain for him or Lucas's anger if he discovers you want to marry her. There are a lot of characters I would love to have gotten to know in this game such as the bartender Emmett or the war hero librarian. 
but once their friendship hits 10, you pretty much know all there is to know about them, and that isn't really much. Which is honestly heartbreaking, because in future games, the writers make each person seem unique and integral into the world building. This is another example in which a proper remake of this game would go a long way in creating a memorable cast and having the opportunity for some real groundbreaking world building. So now for the biggest possible crime out of them all. Something that has made this game age 100 times worse than it really needed to. Something that makes the original Yakuza on PS2 to look like it aged like a fine wine. Yeah, for me, it's that bad. That is the padding in this game. I estimate this game did not have so much needless padding, this 30 or so hour game could have been finished in about 5 hours, 8 at most if you account for 1 hour per dungeon. It's so bad that I honestly don't know where to begin with some of the padding here, but I guess I'll start with the more egregious stuff. Oh, who am I kidding, it's all pretty egregious. So you're probably wondering, how does one progress through the game's plot, or what little of plot there is? Is it just finishing each dungeon and progressing to the next? Nope! You have to till 100 squares of land in each dungeon before the mayor will allow you to explore the next dungeon, so you better keep track of how much land that you've tilled. The issue with this is that the fields in the each dungeon are normally cluttered with all sorts of stuff the further you go in, and in the long term the game will punish you for clearing out this space just to till the land, but more on that later. If you have your hoe upgraded, then this is a piece of cake, but early on this is just some of the most painful stuff imaginable. You know why? Because the very first dungeon can only be unlocked if you till 100 squares of land in your own field first. This is a bit outrageous for me because normally when I start a new story of Seasons game or even Rune Factory, I only till about 18 um, squares of land, enough for say two packs of seeds, and to grow my farm from there. I never knew until this game that there would be any real reason to constantly till the soil. But the worst part is, unless I completely missed it, which is incredibly possible, I may have just skipped over this on accident while talking to everyone, there is nothing in this game that tells you about doing this in order to progress. So you can end up wasting weeks of in-game time before you actually till enough land to unlock the first dungeon. Maybe that was intended. But even if it was the case, how would you even know to go back to the mayor after a certain amount of time to check in on this? I had a friend at one point who didn't even know about this until he got all the way through the first summer and into Fall 1. This is also something that could potentially bite you later on if you procrastinate too much. So on the topic of the game punishing you for procrastination, the game will also actively punish you for playing too well or too fast. The first three dungeons in the game can be unlocked and played through normally. However, the fourth dungeon, Misty Bloom Cavern, can only be accessed during the winter months. I had cleared the first three dungeons by the middle of Summer 1, so I had to take the rest of the summer and the entire fall season off just to grind because I could not progress the dungeons any further. This is because you have to wait for the lake to freeze over to actually enter the dungeon, even if you got the pass to get into it. Now, I get it. I guess the game wanted me to do other things outside of the dungeon crawling, but the problem is the game doesn't offer me much else to do besides dungeon crawling. So for the rest of the summer and fall, I just decided to grind to upgrade my house, which is another rabbit hole I'll get into in a moment. But the problem with Misty Bloom is, is that if you do not finish it before the end of the winter, you will be forced to wait an entire in-game year before you can have another chance of going through Misty Bloom again. I've heard horror stories of people not being able to finish Misty Bloom until like year 3 or 4 in the game. Now that could be intentional I guess, but there really isn't that much in the game to justify the long wait if you happen to miss the dungeon, or if you're unable to finish it by the end of the winter. I think what is also one of the worst case scenarios is you getting access to Misty Bloom right as the winter is ending, or at the start of the new year, because again, you will have almost an entire year of basically not being able to do much of anything. But, on the other hand, you can do some of the other things the game has to offer because in that time span it'll take for you to get back to the winter, you, you, you may be able to unlock some of the other things, and this is through crafting and upgrading your tools. But, like I said, with the amount of time it may take, that's the biggest catch to it. So if you want to be able to become a self-sufficient farmer, you'll need to upgrade your crafting stations and tools. But how do you upgrade your tools beyond what the blacksmith allows or do crafting? Well, simple! Upgrade your house! Oh? How much does that cost? Only a measly 200,000 gold and 2,000 pieces of wood. The money part isn't that big of a deal, ironically. If you upgrade your hammer, you could make that in a few days grinding in the mines and not farming, which is a bit odd. But getting 2,000 pieces of wood? Well, good luck doing this for hours. 
I did this for about two or three hours and got about 1k wood. Halfway there! Oh, and if you run out of stumps to chop up, you have to go into the dungeons and find more. Wait, what was that? You tilled and farmed all the land there and never bothered to until it? Well, you better get your hammer ready to until every piece of land so more stumps can spawn. Yeah, this drove me insane. In order to make this process faster, you need to do all of this just to be able to get the means to unlock it. Funnily enough, you can make it through the game without having to rely on crafting, but man does it make it a bit more challenging. It's just so weird that a game-changing aspect is locked behind some of the most tedious grinding imaginable. This is something that has thankfully opened up more in future games from the start, and it would be nice if Rune Factory 1 was revisited and the crafting was made more accessible at the start, because the crafting in this game does open up for a lot of possibilities. It's just a shame it's locked behind so much grinding. Honestly, there is so much more I can discuss about this game, but we are probably getting into a dangerous runtime area. Or not, I'm just recording all of this now, so I won't know until I'm in the editing room, so hey, future Gamalad, are we getting into dangerous runtime? Well, hello there, past Gamalad. Um, no, this video will be under 20 minutes, so you could have talked much more about the things you disliked and liked about this game, but alas, that is that did not happen. Oh well, back to past me. So let's discuss one more thing about this game, and that is the plot. There really isn't much of one. The story of this game doesn't really begin to take off until the last few hours of the entire game. So most of your venture through this game is pretty aimless. And that's about it. It's the first game, so it's setting up the groundwork, so don't expect a ton out of the lore of this game. It's pretty basic and borderline boring, which is a bit of a shame because reading some more of the lore items in the game, it does try to set up some groundwork for something expansive and more of an ever-growing world, and thankfully we do get that in the later games. But sadly the world of Rune Factory 1 just seems like a distant memory. So that is my entire time playing through Rune Factory. You could argue that for the time, this was an innovative JRPG, and should have been encouraged, but I honestly don't know how this game reviewed as well as it did, and at the end of the day, I really did not like this game. I'm glad this is not my first Rune Factory title, because if it was, good grief, I don't think I would ever play more of these games. The game honestly would benefit so much from a remake, and no, Frontier isn't a remake of this. A ground-up remake could easily address all the issues I brought forward in this video, and make the story and characters much more enjoyable. Seriously, this entry on its own has a ton of potential to it. The base game currently has an interesting cast of characters that it does nothing with, it has a really solid soundtrack, and if expanded more on its lore and refined the gameplay, you would have a really solid JRPG. Hopefully I have a much more enjoyable time in Rune Factory 2. And there you have it, the first Rune Factory retrospective is in the books. I am now off to begin my adventures in Rune Factory 2, and I hope to have a retrospective out for that in due time, and also be on the lookout for my Legend of Heroes Trails in the Sky first chapter retrospective. That's gonna happen too, I promise. So thanks for watching today's video. Commentaries and reviews like this are only made possible by the continued support of my subscribers, YouTube members, and patrons on Patreon. If you want to support continued videos such as this, please consider subscribing for future reviews, commentaries, let's plays, and more. And if you really love what I do here, consider becoming a channel member or a patron at patreon.com slash gamalad. All links will be down in the description below. And once again everyone, thanks for watching. And if I sounded really tired by the end of this, it's because I am. This was a real endurance test to get through. So thank you everyone who believed in me and watched me get through it. I still plan on streaming through the rest of Rune Factory 1 on YouTube and then heading into Rune Factory 2. But yeah, this was a challenge. It was a fun challenge. I enjoyed doing it and it's cemented in my mind. I want to do more. But for those who may have noticed, yeah, wow, you sound dead by the end. This game kind of me feel, felt feel, bleh, feel a bit dead on the inside too. So again, thanks for watching. This is, I just wanted to add this little post editor's note in here.